trips to Hamburg to be made. And so then they went back home and then they became local stars in the Cavern Club, playing all the local venues and sure. party, here, private here parties. Sure, here were these homeboys. Now they're coming back in full black leather. And, you know, people, people didn't quite remember because, you know, months away, uh, when you're young, seems like forever. They come back, here's these guys all kind of macho and rock and roll now and producing this whale of a sound that they developed in Hamburg and this energy that just blew you against the wall. And the kids in Liverpool have never seen anything like it. They say, my, these Germans speak good English. <laughs> Direct, direct, direct from Hamburg. Direct right. from Hamburg, the Beatles. Signs that were saying that. So playing locally, they were selling out the Cavern Club, the lunchtime session. Sure. I know the, the owner of the Cavern Club wanted it to be a jazz club, so they used to introduce the rock to numbers as a jazz tune right. to, to kind of get over that. But because they were becoming bigger and bigger, uh, there was a local guy, a record store owner, or a furniture shop owner that started to take note of them, right? There was a very dapper young Jewish gentleman named Brian Epstein. And he was running his parents' furniture store. But he wanted to, to be more than that. He went to the uh, Royal Academy of Drama. He had theater in his blood. Uh, but he had a system. He was running the North End Music Store, NEMS Enterprises. And he had a system where if someone come in and ask for a record, and if he didn't have it, he'd make damn sure that he'd get it somehow, one way or another. He was going to satisfy each and every customer. And as legend has it, this Raymond Jones comes in one day and says, you got a record by the Beatles? He says, the Beatles? Yeah, it came in from Germany. And so he was on a quest. And Brian asking around, asked these girls, have you heard of the Beatles? Yes, they're just right down the street at the cavern. Really? So he decided to pay a visit, as it were. Uh, I believe it was Alistair Taylor went with him and saw the Beatles and was just immediately taken by me. He said, you just... He says, I mean, they were out of tune and they were rough. And, and the place stunk and everything. Yeah, else. But, he's, but he said there was something about them that was just magnetic. Uh, and that's when he decided, I'm going to manage these guys. And he, he had never been a manager. He wanted to be an actor, right? At theater. Yes. And yes. He to there were two things school. wrong with Brian Epstein in 1960. He was Jewish and homosexual. And that was illegal at the time. Illegal. Right? Yeah, you Could you imagine that? that? You could be arrested for being homosexual. And so he had, you know, and in Liverpool's a tough city. I mean, I've been there. It's, you know, it's tough. But somehow they survived. They did. And he ended up signing them to a contract. He didn't actually sign the contract. He had Alistair sign it, I guess, kind of as a safety net for yes. himself. But he signed them to a contract and did all four Beatles show up and, and put their name on the, on the deal or what happened? Well, Paul actually brought, I mean, John actually brought Bob Wooler who is the compare, the, the MC that, yeah. at the Cavern Club, to act as his dad to make sure that everything was on the up and up. Paul wasn't there when they all arrived at the office, and Brian was getting quite irate because Brian's really a stickler for detail. Where is this McCartney? You know, Paul finally shows up an hour later, and he's, oh, I was taking a bath. And George goes, well, at least he's clean. <laughs> he's very clean. Very clean. So, uh, but, then, but then Brian laid down the law and said, listen, I'm going to make something out of you, but you're going to have to listen to me. You're going to have to change the way you dress, the way no swearing on stage. Yeah, quit chewing gum and throwing food at each other, stick to a regular program, all of that. And actually, it started to work out because then they were booking everything and they were on the BBC radio shows and they were getting, oh, before they got on the BBC radio shows, they were, they were selling out the clubs, but they were missing that component of having a record deal. Yes, and of course, there was one big change that still had to be made. There was a guy in the group that got more attention than, if you can believe, than Paul McCartney, than John Lennon, than Stuart Sutcliffe, than George Harrison. It was Peter Best. An Indian-born, handsome, kind of a James Dean swagger thing, quiet guy, but all the girls loved Pete. And when it came time that they got the record contract or were on the verge of it, the Beatles came in and said to Brian, we got to lose Pete. Now, what was the reason behind that? Was it jealousy? Mona Best, Pete's mother, who owned a house that she won like a race, a lottery. And that's, that's how what, she got the house? She bought a big house from that winning, turned the cellar into the Casbah Coffee Club, where teenagers could come and play their rock and roll music. So she was kind of 
co-managing, if you will, because, you know, that was to have a place to play was big enough back then. So she had her hand into it a lot. And of course, Pete being the most popular, you know. But when Brian stepped in, obviously, here we have a huge conflict of interest. And how are you going to break away from that? And the Beatles said, sack them. But they didn't tell him. They never did talk to Pete. And as you know, some of you have met Pete, saw him play. I've been with Pete three, four, five times here, Canada, Liverpool. Very nice guy. And he still swears that not one of them ever spoke to him about the reasoning why he was uh, relieved. And, and there are two camps. One say that he was too popular and the Beatles were threatened by him. The other is he wasn't good enough. I mean, if you listen to some of his early drumming, there might be a case for that. But as Pete says, I was with him for two years. I was good enough to play right. you know, eight hours a night and two years with them. Yeah, and, and still to this day. Now, finally, when Anthology came out in, what, 94, 95, they placed some of Pete's recordings on the album, and he made about four million from that. So it was kind of a poetic justice that he got something out of it, you know. 